so excited uh, that we have. We have Sally Weintraub with us. She's a psychoanalyst and she and writes and talks about how we can understand what underlies our underlies our widespread disavowal of the climate crisis. So Sally, where, where shall we begin? Uh, what would you, would you like to just get right into it or do you want to have a wee chat beforehand or what, what would you like to do first? I think I'd like to get into it. So. Okay, right. Well, uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have you. So in your own time. Thank you very much much Neve uh, for inviting me to be part of this joint community initiative on engaging with climate change and I did see that Catherine Casey um, described Neve's involvement as and I'm quoting helping us to bring the community together to engage with climate change in a new way uh, and I love this description uh, because I believe uh, taking in the reality about climate is difficult and it's best achieved together in groups. That's why I love that this project is grounded in a community, um, in Abbey Leaks community. So getting going, uh, well, first of all, the climate crisis is much too large a subject to cover in just one talk. So I will pick up a few strands to begin a discussion. But first I want to give some context for what I'm going to say. Now, as we know, people currently are facing multiple threats to survival, the pandemic, an economic crisis, a climate and environmental crisis, and the social fabric in danger of unraveling. These crises are interwoven and they stem from the destructive way that we are treating planet Earth and nature, all of them. The viral pandemic, brought along with it an anxiety pandemic. However, I see this anxiety pandemic as touching on existential anxiety uh, that is currently deeper even than anxieties about COVID, about economics and about the social fabric. I suggest many people are experiencing existential anxiety about the damaged state of the climate and the environment. They know, even while keeping their knowledge largely, many of them, largely out of their conscious awareness, that they depend utterly on what nature provides. People often place climate change at the bottom of their list of things to worry about. And let's face it, there is plenty to worry about uh, at any one moment. And these things are also driven by the media um, or amplified often by the media. There's the COVID crisis, the economy, the state of politics. It's as though there's a fantasy that when somehow, when all these other problems have been sort of solved, in quotes, then we will attend to the climate. And this is precisely the wrong way around. Because as I've said, the climate crisis is driving all the other crises. Deep down, people do uh, know this and they're feeling highly anxious about it. And uh, the anxiety can be so acute, it's been described as existential. It's about very survival. I want to suggest that what we see is people trying to manage their anxiety in two sorts of ways. One by hovering uh, above it and experiencing too little anxiety, and the other by experiencing too much anxiety. Now, a word about anxiety. Anxiety is actually our inner alarm call. It lets us know when we need to act and how fast we need to act. There's nothing wrong with anxiety. And climate anxiety is actually a healthy response to the current situation. Now, Experiencing too little anxiety is maladaptive. Experiencing too much anxiety can have complex strands to it. On the one hand, seeing the degree of environmental devastation that has already occurred can feel quite overwhelming. And when people feel overwhelmed, they need to protect themselves from that. On the other hand, oh, it's just all too much, best think about something else. That can be a way of more actively keeping oneself dissociated from one's concern. 
that means split off from, putting it somewhere over there, disassociated. Uh, and that can also be a way of trying to deal with uh, feeling overwhelmed. It, it can become part of denial itself. Now to explore why climate change is by now so hard to think about, I need to introduce the idea of bubbles. A bubble, as I'm using it, is a collective retreat from reality. It's a psychic, it's a psychological state of affairs in which one creates a world that's cut off from reality. Bubbles are largely socially constructed. Uh, my subject is the climate bubble. And I argue that it's designed to minimize our moral unease that we would feel if we were to step out of the bubble and see the real world clearly. The climate bubble is kept inflated through often subtle cultural pressure to collude with slippery, corrupting arguments. And the world seen from inside the bubble is a virtual, as if fake world. It has all the difficulty and the responsibility taken out of it. It's a prettified world. Unsustainable behavior is thought of as normal and usual, indeed the only way. Inside the bubble, people can act without seeing the need to count the true cost. And the mechanisms that preserve the bubble are largely maintained by unconscious group pressures. People in the bubble are largely unaware of this. They're drawn into the bubble. The climate bubble has been seeded, inflated, and then maintained largely through what I've called a culture of uncare. And by that, I mean a culture with a perverse aim. The aim is to encourage people to disassociate or distance themselves from the part of them that does care and is socially responsible. The culture of uncare actively seeks to boost people's wishful uh, and apparently all powerful side and thus it kind of infantilizes them and regresses them psychologically. In my book that's coming out in April, I argue that neoliberalism's culture of uncare, it's our current global political dominant system, I argue that neoliberalism's culture of uncare, which includes advertising, media, political propaganda and social group pressure, a very important part of it, the social group pressure, uh, works to undermine being caring and taking responsibility. I'm very sorry I can't go into this. Uh, you know, that would take another lecture, but it's fascinating. And so by the culture of uncare, I mean it actively seeks to uncare us. The culture of uncare is designed to make ignoring others and future generations seem not a problem. And that has suited the needs of a deregulated neoliberal economy that puts uh, short-term profits first and, and encourages consumption. Now the climate bubble is just one of a whole number of bubbles, but it's by far, it's far larger and far more damaging and far more consequential than any bubble in human history. It has involved planning to extract all for now for the few with storms and instability for the rest. The climate bubble has served a particular sanitizing psychological function which is to bleach violence, death and suffering from the picture. And this bubble is now bursting. It must burst, all bubbles burst, as it's based on omnipotent magical thinking. It's not rooted in reality-based thinking. The damage and the suffering caused by this bubble are now too huge to conceal. It must burst uh, because reality is, is, is intervening and becoming obvious to everyone. One sign of the climate bubble bursting is that more people are talking openly about the state of the climate. The psychoanalyst Hannah Siegel argued 
she was talking about the nuclear issue actually, but she argued that staying silent is the real crime. And I would add that social silence about climate has kept this bubble afloat long enough for the resulting damage to be staggering, as we know. Now that the climate bubble is bursting, very broadly speaking, people are either trying to stay in the bubble with further denial, or they're struggling to face reality. And of course, many people and many of us veer between the two. Inside the bubble, people believe that they are in the privileged group entitled to be saved. Why? Because they're special and worth it. It's the others who are going to be sacrificed. And I call this phenomenon Noah's Arkism. Uh, I think you can pick up the imagery. There's much to say about Noah's Arkism, but I want to concentrate instead, not on staying in the bubble, but the difficulties of trying to face reality when coming out of the bubble. Many of us are trying to cope with the shock of emerging from the climate bubble and trying to stay sane while facing climate reality today when so much damage to our life support systems has already been done and some of it is irreparable. This is very hard. How do we face climate reality? And crucially, how do we stay with difficult feelings so our understanding is not just, what I mean is stay with the feelings so that our understanding is not just temporary and flash in the pan? Psychoanalysis calls this working through our feelings and staying with them in our conflicts. Sorry, psychoanalysis calls this process of working through. Uh, it's working through our feelings and our conflicts. And of course, working through is an ongoing process. I believe we first need to appreciate the fact that we face not one or a few, but a whole series of shocks. The first being that climate news is itself shocking. Global warming has largely happened during the last 40 years. It's neoliberalism's legacy, and that is shocking. But more shocking is that very recently, as we know, warming has started to speed up. As I said earlier, the problem with climate reality is we tend to feel either too much or too little about it, veering between shock, uh, too much, and disavowal. That's the kind of denial where we minimize reality or we make it meaningless to us, which is very dangerous, actually. And neither state, the too much or the too little, helps us to think rationally. And by thinking rationally, I mean thinking that includes our feelings and our bodily reactions. In addition to shock at the news itself, people are likely to feel assaulted by feelings uh, that being in the bubble protected them from. Shame, once unconsciously shared out amongst members of the group, may suddenly feel particularly acute. When I heard about the vast number of animals who died in the Australian bushfires recently, I actually felt ashamed to be a member of my own species. Some feelings released will be melancholic and potentially paralyzing. Others, while very painful, are lively and part of grieving. And let's not forget uh, that we only grieve uh, what we love. Uh, and if we love our planet and we love and value things about nature, why wouldn't we be grieving? A further shock is realizing more clearly that most leaders currently in power are continuing with policies leading to ecocide despite their words. This means that in effect, they do not care if people live or die. Surely our leaders can't be that collectively crazy. And knowing that they still are is very hard to bear. And by crazy, I don't mean individually psychopathic. I mean, they're caught up in a, a political system that renders them crazy. Then we're no longer in the climate bubble. We have radically to reevaluate our sense of ourselves we see that we're vulnerable and unprotected when we thought, we may have thought we were invincible. Death suddenly feels closer and more real. We see how easily seducible we are and how prey to colluding with corrupting politi political propaganda designed to support continuing with business as usual. And we may feel shocked that we allowed ourselves to be duped. 
At the same time, it's also deeply replenishing to emerge from a bubble, which is in effect a collective psychic retreat from reality. When we emerge, we see the real picture more clearly. Stepping out of the bubble enables us to see strength and beauty in the interconnected systems that support life, and also to see the fragility in those systems and the moral imperative for humans to respect their limits in the way that they live their lives. With this background, my question is, how do we work through the environmental tragedy unfolding and stay sane? We need to find these answers together. For my part, these days I read as much environmental news as possible, but never before writing or sleeping, as I find it too disturbing and it makes me anxious, and I'm not alone. Many people are reporting eco-anxiety, which, unless it's crippling, is on the side of life, as I said, it's care's alarm call to face reality and to act. Then we may be feeling traumatized by climate news. Trauma can overwhelm the capacity to think clearly. It can leave people struggling with feeling over and underwhelmed by the traumatizing events. Traumatized people can find it harder to judge whom is to blame with any sense of proportion, and they're prone to disassociate from the traumatizing event. I've found studying war trauma in soldiers very helpful in thinking about potential climate trauma. First of all, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, which we know as PTSD. This is when one's sense of safety has been traumatically shattered and one may constantly re relive the trauma in the present, feeling that danger may strike again at any moment, and this is called hyperarousal. Many PTSD sufferers eventually convert their hyperarousal into hyperconstriction, where all emotion, even pleasure, is toned down and experiences are avoided that might evoke any feelings of threat. So to what extent are many of us hypervigilantly on the lookout for climate information and using hyperconstriction to shut it out? Because this could be a way to protect our hearts and minds from overwhelm in traumatizing conditions. Then there's pre-traumatic pre stress disorder. That's the trauma that soldiers suffer in prolonged situations of helpless anticipation of a future traumatizing event like climate breakdown. The psychiatrist, Lise, Lise van Susteren, sees our stress at anticipating and pending climate breakdown as a form of pre-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, right now, People across the world and climate refugees are already exp experiencing traumatic climate events. Their situations worsened by COVID-19 and the added economic hardship it brings. When a journalist asked me, how do we tell people about the climate emergency without traumatizing them? I said, it's not easy to know how, but I firmly believe that what matters is whether we give truthful pictures about the future in a caring way, not in a careless, switched off way that does not relate to how people might be feeling. I heard a child say, mummy school told us today that the world is about to end, is that true? And her parent answered, of course it's not true, and immediately changed the subject. I suggest that bald answer, while true in a, tr in a strict sense, abandoned the child and delegitimized the child's voice and concern. While rage, especially rage at injustice, feeling dismissed and not respected, can fuel the world to act for the better, it can also be part of a trauma reaction, in which case it's more likely to be loveless and tending towards hate acts repetitive, destructive grievance, and identifying with the ones who are traumatizing, with the traumatizers, which is why we need to pay close attention to whether we're feeling traumatized. I now turn to moral injury, and uh, the violation of our sen sense of what's right. Studying stories of morally injured soldiers reveals this pattern. A sense of betrayal by a leadership that idealized the view and hid the truth, that lied, that devalued life and was casual about killing. 
the helplessness of feeling caught up in a vast machine that prevents one from acting with care and conscience, the collapse of one's inner ideals, feeling one's own experience and sense of reality is just brushed aside and does not count. Now this could be a description of what many people now report feeling about the economic and political world in which they live, one that inevitably generates a climate crisis. The global economy now structures how people live in ways that conflict with their ordinary human decency. Daily life, for the more affluent, is fraught with moral dilemmas. Do I take the car or the bus or the bike? Do I buy that book online from a company that employs people on zero hours contracts? What do I do when nearly everything I buy comes wrapped up in plastic? My very way of living causes environmental and social damage. How do I live with the guilt and shame of my participation? Suffering moral injury is a sign of mental health, not disorder. It means that one's conscience is alive. Staunching and repairing moral injury involve psychic work, psychological work, facing remorse, seeking forgiveness, gaining new understanding of one's own individual culpability and being able to place that in a wider context. And it's in these ways that one's shattered ideals can be rebuilt and what's right refound amidst scars. Judith Herman, who studied survivors of trauma, is one of a number who've argued that social action serves as the strongest antidote to traumatic experience. It creates, quotes, an alliance with others based on cooperation and shared purpose. I believe breaking with our current culture of uncare requires a collective effort of working through grief, remorse, and a reshouldering of collective responsibility. And it matters greatly that this is undertaken in a spirit of forgiveness of self and other. The real tragedy with the climate bubble is that it allowed so much damage to accrue that facing climate reality now can feel unbearable. And what I do know from my own experience is that trying to bear it and allowing myself to feel at times overwhelmed helps me better contain my distress and soften my rage. I find that I'm more reflective and sadder, knowing I too profited from ignoring nature's limits and colluded with the culture that worked to uncare me and us. I think we need to find ways collectively to work these sorts of feelings through together. Coming towards the end, I want to read you parts of a poem by a young North American poet, Mia Nelson, about how the climate crisis leaves her feeling. Um, I'm only reading parts of her poem. Uh, it's called, You Call It Eco Trauma. Wendell Berry called it the peace of wild things, but really it was the ending of things that we saw no ending to, our feet standing on the sweet glacial edge of heaven. I call it waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and knowing your mother is being killed in the next room and not being able to move. I call it crying every birthday since I was 10, knowing nothing can save me, us, it, ours from time. It's funny, the only thing that can really save me is dark soil and waterfalls and sun, suddenly the moment you can see everything around you when it finally becomes obvious. Nothing this still and clear and God-bred could belong to anyone who speaks our greedy language of want. I want to highlight the lines, I call it waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and knowing your mother is being killed in the next room but not being able to move. These words speak to me of one young person struggling to work through and to bear irreparable damage. The damage here might be earth being gradually killed by ecocide. It might also refer to such disassociation that we no longer hear children's cries, even our own children's. We do hear them and we are moved, but are we moved to the point where we're prepared to give up any privilege and make sacrifices for the next generation and room for them? 
Inside the climate bubble, this acute conflict is deadened and our caring part is disassociated from. And might this bubble-like deadened state also be the dead mother Mia is referring to? In my experience, children and young people, including young adults, are often much more in touch with climate reality than their elders. They know they are the generation who will have to live in a world in which the elders allocated them so little entitlement. When Mia says, you call it eco-trauma, I call it knowing your mother is being killed in the next room, might she be speaking of a form of deafness that allows one group to leave all the suffering to be felt by another group? I believe neoliberalism's culture of uncare's most deadly appeal has been in its seductive promise that people can apparently dispense with inner moral struggle between what we may wish for and what is sustainable. However, to transition to a sustainable way of living, people need to stay with that conflict between what we wish for and what's sustainable uh, and consider Earth in every single thing we do. When we believe we're entitled to be spared the hassle of caring, we treat the lively reality-seeking part of ourselves as unimportant. We undermine its willpower. The most treacherous fake promise offered by neoliberalism's self-serving dominant culture of uncare is return to the bubble and you can be spared inner discomfort. Then we fall prey to the deadly fantasy that the pain of living can be avoided. The danger is that if the fossil fuel age is not ended very soon now and sections of humanity do not bring rampant greed and injustice under control, reality will become ever more unbearable and overwhelming and people may increasingly be tempted to defend against too much uh, emotional pain with the too little uh, psychic defense. Thank you. I've reached the end. Thank you so much, Sonny. Gosh, that's um, there's a lot to think about in that. That's that's incredible. Mm -hmm.